What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. As always, it's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs got a fantasy football. This will be another behind the scenes look at the fantasy football industry. And the reason this is coming out today, so I asked you guys in one of my previous videos, how often do you want to see these? Um, and most of the responses were once a week. And I had them already scheduled to come out Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. So I was doing three times a week. And then I was like, maybe that's too much because these are the series that I really want you guys to see. Um, and I don't want to oversaturate you guys and you know keep you trying to like catch up and whatnot. So I think I'm going to scale it back and maybe put them out every Monday. So once a week on Mondays, because I think these videos are like good for your mind and your soul and you get a lot of goodness from them in terms of like, you know, it's a good way to start the week. I know you guys like my In The Muck Monday videos, but the summer's almost over, so I have to be uh, done with those pretty soon. So maybe I'll move those informational videos to Tuesday. And these will be coming out probably once a week through Monday, and I already have six of them done. So those will be the six videos um, that are on the Mondays coming up. Now, if you're watching this, you've already watched the first two, which were Tuesday and Thursday. It was Andy and Josh Hornsby, Josh ADHD, and Andy from the Fantasy Footballers. So I want to I want to have you guys starting off your week positively, and, and these interviews and these conversations are always ways to try to kind of improve yourself and, and be better, and hopefully it's like a pickup to start your week. So from now on, these are going to be coming out once a week, every Monday, and hopefully I have enough guests that I can almost do this thing throughout the entire season. I think that would be pretty cool. Um, in terms of like analysis and stats and, and player analysis, uh, those will obviously still be coming, but they will be on different dates. So we'll probably switch the Monday videos to Tuesday and do these on Monday from now on. We have a, an amazing lineup coming out. This is James Coe, formerly of the NFL Network. He's a two-time Emmy Award-winning sports reporter, guys. Uh, I still don't even know why he would join my show, but I'm super happy he did. We got really in-depth, as these conversations always do. He was a pleasure to have on. All these guys have been awesome to talk to and speak to and just pick their brains and whatnot. You're going to enjoy this one. We have James Coe. Next week's is my man Brad Evans from Yahoo. I can't believe he agreed to come on, which is awesome. Then we have C.D. Carter, Denny Carter, the owner of Draft Day Consultants. And we have the Fantasy Football Counselor, episode number six. And we have just a lot of awesome, awesome, awesome guests that we keep getting to come on for this. So I'm super excited to continue this series. I hope you guys enjoy. If you do, make sure you give the thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new. Make sure you find all of James's info down below if you want to go follow him. But yeah, that's uh, basically the message I wanted to get across. We're going to do this once a week on Mondays going forward. Thank you, as always, for the support and watching. What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. We are now in the third installment of the new series up on my channel, uh, in which we are looking at the behind the scenes of the fantasy football industry. We've recently had Andy from the Fantasy Footballers on. We've had Josh ADHD, who works with Fantasy Insiders, as well as Roto Grinders. And we're just trying to get a very wide variety of influencers in the space to kind of talk about the behind the scenes, you know, the business, the marketing. And today we have another awesome, awesome, very special guest. We have James Coe, previously of the NFL Network. We have a multi-time Emmy Award-winning sports reporter, as well as, you know, he's got more hardware out there than, than Tom Brady, I feel like, at this point. But he's been around the block. He's got experience in um, in these mainstream networks, and he's got a very different yeah. angle than the than the other previous um, than the other previous guests on the channel. And I'm super excited to dive in with James and kind of, you know, learn what he's seen in terms of the industry and, and learn what he's... Um, seen in terms of working with people who are, you know, very well developed and with a lot of experience. So, James, welcome to what we call the HQ over here. Uh, why don't you kind of uh, give my audience a little breakdown of, of what you've been working on and, and where you've been and kind of your uh, your upbringing, I guess, into the fantasy football industry. Well, first, I just want to say, you know, great to be part of the program. I, I love the concept uh, of the podcast and to follow guys like Josh and Andy, uh, two guys who I, I mean, respect the hell out of. Um, and they are, you know, uh, part of that fantasy Twitter community and, and just the fantasy community in general. Those guys are, those guys are giants in the game. So, uh, to kind of be able to follow those two guys, um, it, it means a lot and it's a big time honor. Um, to get back to what you're talking about, where I came from, man, it's like, it's crazy, you know, I think about this journey, right? Because uh, you're right, I, I was most recently with NFL Network. I haven't announced anything yet in terms of my next steps, but we're pretty close. Um, but yeah, you know, 
In terms of my journey, it's been, you know, it's been about a little over 10 years. But when I first started in television, um, I was a part-time uh, football, high school football photographer. <laughs> so I would, I, videographer. So I'd go to, I'd work for 10 bucks an hour, eh, work maybe 20 hours a week and, uh, and get, you know, high school highlights from football games. And I just was able to kind of work my way up, work my way up and, um, and, and get to kind of where I got to today. So it's, uh, it's been a really cool journey. Um, and something that I, I definitely appreciate, or at least try to appreciate, uh, on a daily basis, man. Yeah. I mean, you've, uh, you 10 years basically on, on the way up is, is a long time to grind it out to get to where you, uh, you want to be. And I think that's a strong takeaway for the people listening, man. It takes a lot of hard work to get to where you want to go. Um, and I think it's interesting having you on the show after some of the guys that we've had Previously, because you look at the fantasy footballers who started their podcast just you know three years ago and they've exploded. So I almost look at you as more of an old school approach to making it in the industry, right? Because I, you know I did a little creeping on your background, and I know you went to <laughs> University of Cal, and then you got your degree yeah. in uh, in journalism after that at, at USC, I believe it was, right? Yes, it was. So you took a very traditional route in the sense that that's how most people came up when, you know, during your generation and yeah. the way that people come up. But today's day and age, uh, you know, with the platforms that we have, social media through YouTube or Twitter, you know, you could make your name really doing anything and, and starting your own platform and, and building it from there. Um, now, I'm, I'm assuming most of the people that you've worked with have kind of taken a similar path to you because you probably have to have some official credentials in, editor, in order to get into like the whole NFL network kind of scenes. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that in, in terms of just like how, how the industry is kind of moving towards um, more like personal platforms and things like that right. rather than taking the, the old traditional approach that you kind of did? Yeah, you know, um, it's funny when people ask me for career advice because I'm like, I'm not sure I'm the best guy. I can give you some perspective about work ethic and, and you know, um, my daily routine. But um, you're right. I'm kind of sort of one of the last of a dying breed of uh, journalists who have kind of come up, uh, took my time kind of getting to where I got to. Um and you know, and this is the crazy thing, man. It took me six years to get to NFL Network. That is, from my background, I mean, that is so fast. So think about where I'm coming from when I look at some of these other young cats coming up um, where, you know, you talk about the fantasy footballers, man. Three years, I mean, that's like that's like that. Yep. It's crazy how fast it is. So um, for me, I mean, even for six, even taking six years going from, again, that part time gig to, to being able uh, to get up on, onto NFL Network and hosting a fantasy football show. I mean, I was just as surprised as anybody else how quickly that journey happened for me. And again, I really honestly do believe that was a very, very fast journey for me. Um, I'm a person that I don't think was, you know, necessarily the most talented dude, but I'm a grinder. You know what I mean? So I, I was I break down tape on myself. I'd listen to uh, audio on myself. Think about how I, I want to get better. Write those things down. Pros, cons. What did I do well? What didn't I do well? What's that one thing that I want to work on? Um, and that's really one of those things where every single week I would literally look at a list that I wrote down. I pick one thing that I want to work on. And for the next week, that's all I would work on, that one thing. Wow. Um, okay. And this is the kind of business, man, when you're doing on-air stuff, when you're writing, whenever you're doing, you know, just creating content, it's like trying to staple jello to a wall. You know what I mean? Like you can get pieces up there, <laughs> Yeah. you know, but but things start sliding down. And, you just, and you're just constantly just trying to staple things up there. Um, but the jello just keeps falling. At least, at least mentally, that's kind of what it feels like anyways, you know? So... Um, I, that's, that's how I st stayed grounded in, in terms of trying to march forward was just, you know, trying to pick that one thing and, and really get better at that one thing and hoping, uh, it sticks moving forward. But yeah, getting to, you know, talking about a little bit about the background, man. Yeah. You know, I, I worked in news. I did a lot of news, uh, coming up the first six years of my career, Pretty much mostly news. Uh, it was only until the last couple years where I was a weekend sports anchor that 
um, I was able to kind of flex my my sports knowledge and and uh, my on camera persona in terms of, of being a sports guy. So the Emmys that I've won, I, I've won four of them. I, I guarantee I'm one of the only people in the business that have two <laughs> that have two uh, Emmys in, in news and then two more in sports. Yeah, man. you see what I'm saying. So it, it's a weird, it, it's such a weird uh, mix because mostly you see guys win them in news or in sports. You don't. You don't really see that crossover thing. But for me, that was kind of the game plan, man. Day one was um, I was able to jump markets, move up markets very quickly because I had such a strong news background. Um, and then when I finally got to a place where, OK, I know this is kind of either uh, a, a part time destination, as in I could see myself being here five years or it's really the next launching pad to a national stage, which it ended up being um, when I got my job in L.A., that's when I was really pushing for, asking for, trying to create content in the sports world. Uh, and luckily, I had a boss that really believed in me, um, even though I had such a limited sports background. Um, and he gave me a chance, and he let me run with it. And, and I never looked back ever since. Yeah, that's so awesome. Because, I mean, you've worked with some of the, the bigger names in the industry, and I'm sure they've like taught you so much along the way. Now, you said you had this strong news background that eventually translated into sports. Would you say um, that... Was the news and the reporting your passion or was that like something you were good at? You followed it and then you were like, I can translate this into my passion, right? And sports was your passion. Realize that you can combine both, make this almost like a lifestyle thing for you. Um, yeah. That's, is that the kind of the path that, that happened for you? So, yeah, 100% right. Um, the latter, uh, which was sports has always been my passion. As a matter of fact, um, you know, coming out of Cal, I had a sales job. For two years, I sold insurance for, for for a year. Then I sold, you know, high tech, you know, service contracts for a year. And I was living in San Francisco, making pretty good money. But I left those paychecks to pursue sports. Um, and it just happened to be that you're right. After a while, I really saw that news was going to be the easiest, the path of least resistance uh, to getting a, a a livable paycheck because. Most people, I don't care, you know, whether you're, you're talking news, fantasy, whatever. If you're just a media content creator, I think the the biggest barrier to entry is finances. Mm -hmm. I mean, people talk about, hey, listen, how do I break in? How do I break in, bro? Breaking in is the least of your concerns. It's once you break in, how do you get paid? Right. That's the number one problem. I think. You know, this is not a, a profession that has a, a very long lifespan. It has nothing to do with breaking in. All it has to do with how long can you sustain that pain? Because early on, the paychecks are very few and far between. And when they come, they're small. Can you survive long enough uh, to make it in this industry? I think that's I think that's one of the, the biggest takeaways that I try to give young people is, listen, man, you got to get your finances straight mm -hmm. before you want to break in. Because if you don't, um, this business will eat you up, chew you out, man. I mean, that's just that that's just the, the, the realistic, you know, um, thing about this business, man, it, it, is again, it is a business. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So um, that was to me doing news and pursuing that moving up markets. Uh, man, when I was younger, man, that, that's the only thing I cared about was moving up markets because if I moved up markets, that means my paycheck got bigger. You know what I mean? Heard that, yeah. um, and that's how I sustained myself. So, um, so yeah, you're right. I, I absolutely 100% use news to transition into sports. And quite honestly, man, if you read my work, if you watch my work, um, you'll see some of that come out because I honestly believe that I have – a pretty good handle boiling down and simplifying very complex ideas and concepts and really making it digestible to the reader and to the viewer. That's, that's a skill that I think I bring in as a host um, that I think, you know, other talent might not necessarily have. Yeah, I agree with that. That's it's such a valuable skill, not only just like reporting wise, and you obviously hand yourself like incredible on camera, but fantasy football specifically, because there's so much noise going on with numbers and stats and analysis That's right. that you have to be able to, uh, you know, convey that to the mainstream in a way that they can understand. That's a great point. And uh, I wanted to kind of touch on something you just talked about and you said breaking in, right? People always want to talk about breaking in and breaking in and breaking in. Great. But I agree with you in the sense that like once you break in, that's only like a, you need that for validation. Like you don't 
breaking mm. in, like, what is that? There's no scale for you to say it's breaking in. Maybe someone, like, acknowledge, like, I, maybe I could say I broke into the industry by having Andy and Josh and you on my channel. But in, in, in the long run, like, what, what does that actually do for me? And I think that kind of goes back to uh, the people that are breaking into the industry through new avenues, like myself through YouTube. And once you build your platform, right, like, I, I was talking about this with Andy about how uh, attention, right, and gaining an audience is so much more valuable than actual money revenue because you could always turn an audience or attention into revenue, but you can't buy an audience with money. So I think it comes down to being very creative and thinking outside the box. Once you, you know, you have to put out value, obviously you have to be very good. You have to build that audience. But once you do that, you know, no, you're not going to have in my position, I'm not going to have a boss who pays me a salary paycheck. I have to think of things. And that's what I'm doing for my audience. Like I, I, uh, I made like in, in e-magazine, right, a draft guide for people and they purchase it for X amount of dollars a pop. And that's a way that I do my revenue. But I try to diversify it in a very large number of ways. So people trying to uh, come up in this industry that are not taking the general route that you did, where you're going to get a steady paycheck week in and week out, need to be able to think outside the box and be creative. And that means pulling ideas from other industries, whether it's consulting or whether it's whatever it might be. It's going to sound crazy at first, but once it's not crazy and you're making money from it, then people are going to be like, oh, that was a great idea. I'm going to try to do that now. You know what I mean? So <laughs> it, it, it's, it's you're right. Instead of breaking in is a validation. That's a mental barrier. But finances is very right. important. You have to approach creating content um, almost from a business aspect. And that's what I love about this series is you're seeing a bunch of different people kind of talk about uh, how they've done that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, what you're talking about, I love it, man. I absolutely love it because to me, um, you know, people people create content and, and, and they just think, okay, all of a sudden, magically, somehow the money is going to start coming in. You know what I mean? Like, nope. <laughs> if you're not approaching that, if you're not approaching content creation with the idea of, of either building an audience, but where does that, why are you building an audience? For fame? For glory? No. And so eventually you could get paid. Right. So yeah, there's a bunch of different avenues for uh, for you to take your content and make money. So it's either you can get a boss, which is totally acceptable. Mm -hmm. Find one of these guys that you know, uh, you know. Uh, there's so many you know fantasy football sites out there that are looking for writers. You can get paid that way. Or as you're doing, you know, you talk about being a Look, it's either being an employee or an employer. Are you gonna are you gonna be self-employed or are you gonna have somebody pay you? Now, either avenue is totally fine, but figure out a way uh, to make that happen. That's just that's what I would tell young people who are, are are trying to you know talk about getting into into fantasy. So just you got to think of yourself and the content you create as as business. And I everyone talks about the side hustle. What what really is the side hustle, man? It's like it's about making money. Right. You know what I mean? So that's uh, that's how you got to view it. You got to view it a little. Uh, uh, I think too many people view it as an artistic endeavor, and not enough people view it as a business endeavor. Right, and that was the big switch for me because I had been doing the YouTube channel for uh, like two summers, I think, previous to last summer, uh, and then my audience started growing. Right, we went from like five hundred to five thousand in the in the midst of one season, and I was like, holy shit, there's. There's something here, you know what I mean? And that's when I started yeah. going from, okay, I'm giving out tons and tons and tons of hours of free value. They'll eventually become loyal to me and I can flip that for revenue. And that's when I approached right. this, this summer. I'm like, yep, this is going to be a business thing. Not so much. I mean, still putting out as much content as I've always done. Um, but yeah, that's, that's huge. And it's, it's super subject, subjective to the person. Like not everyone wants to be an entrepreneur not everyone's going to be good at it, right? Some people are, are the best at being number twos in a company or number sevens or, or writers or, you know, entry level jobs. That's perfectly fine, but you have to be self-aware enough to know what you're good at. Right. And then play to your strengths in that sense. So I think that was a nice little, not, little rant we went on there that I think will help a lot of people out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, 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 for sure. I, I'm interested in talking about the fantasy football industry from the NFL, the actual real NFL perspective, because I'm sure you work yeah. with a lot of people um, that don't do fantasy football and just cover the NFL. So I'm wondering, like, when you're working for the NFL Network, do they? Uh, how influential is fantasy football? to the piece of their, I guess, like, is that a key pillar in the in the content that they're putting out? You see that becoming more and more a piece of, of what you guys are doing at, at the heart of the NFL in, in recent years? Um, is it a giant pillar to the game itself? Yes. Do, at the executive level, 
do they treat it as such? No. Okay. I think at the executive level, they kind of treat it like it's just an automatic built-in thing that runs on itself and is just self-sustaining somehow. They don't put a lot of time. They don't put resources into it. Um, I, this is how I analogize it, man. It's like grocery stores and alcohol. You won't find a grocery store that can stay open unless they sell alcohol. Okay. But you're also not going to find a grocery store that advertises alcohol. That's okay. how the NFL treats <laughs> fantasy. Okay. I don't think I don't think the NFL, quite honestly, can sustain the model that they have right now. Nine billion dollars in television. Who the hell is watching Tennessee Jacksonville in the fourth quarter of a blowout? Right. You know who's watching? You and me. You know why? Because we play fantasy. Exactly. Right. So. It's a huge pillar of what the business is, but they're not going to advertise it. You know what I'm saying? So, um, and you know, and there, I think there's a lot to that because again, still the vast majority of the audience, I don't want to say they don't care about fantasy, but it might be secondary or tertiary to why they watch the games, but it is still a huge pillar. Look, man, bottom line is the ratings for NFL fantasy live were some of the best, uh, at the network, but you, you, it, you'd be hard pressed to find, um, the guys on that show getting paid commensurately or to find promos, um, that really advertise the fact that we were one of the top, you know, rated shows on the network, the fantasy football, the NFL fantasy live podcast, which I was formerly, um, a part of was one of the most successful, largest growing uh, podcasts that they had. If they put any resource, I mean, they put almost no resources. We were an also ran. There were other podcasts that did one quarter of the downloads that we were doing, getting triple the amount of resources. So again, it's not, and it's not to say, oh, I feel underappreciated. That's just the business strategy that they had there at the NFL and you know, yeah, when you're working on the inside and working on that show, would you like to see more resources? Yeah, hundred percent for sure. But as somebody who grew up in a small business household and, and again, I'm t sitting here talking to you about, you know, you got to see yourself as a business and all these mm -hmm. things. I, I can understand it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You want to find people um, that are self-sustaining. You want to find people that are self-motivated. They just want to get the job done. That's what they did at NFL media. Um, and, and quite frankly, I, it's a strategy that obviously is working pretty well because again, they're putting no time, no money, no resources into it. And yet at the same time, uh, these programs are doing very well in and of themselves. Yeah, I I don't know, man. I, I personally think that's a, like a huge mistake on the part of the NFL and like who am I to speak about their business strategy because obviously, you know, they're growing revenue year over year over year. But I just think it's such an untapped market because we look back at, um, I don't know, did you uh, attend the FSTA um, conference earlier no. in July or something? Yeah, I didn't go either, but I read the report afterwards and they're, they're evaluating the fantasy sports industry. At, I think it was $7.2 billion, which is, you know, incredible. And it's not slowing down anytime soon with all the new innovations and stuff coming. And I think it's it's unwise by the NFL to not really make that a, a monster pillar, because like you said, no one's watching those games if they don't have Corey Davis on their fantasy team. They don't have Leonard Fournette on their fantasy team. And I think like there's no way the NFL can't realize that. And I don't know. Uh, I, I guess like one of the other things I try to find out on this series is like what innovations maybe we see coming in the future. I almost think that like you know, who wants to go to an NFL game anymore when you can sit back and watch the red zone at, uh, like on your couch without paying ticket prices or anything like that? You know what right. I mean? So I think they need to do a better job of realizing that people will come to the stadium maybe if they have like, obviously they're not going to have like a red zone playing on the on the screen because everyone would just be watching the screen instead of the field. But like, I don't know. Do you, do you see any innovations maybe like inside the stadium or a way that the NFL can work with the fans? Because as much as, you know, people might think of fantasy as a tertiary product, I think within the next like five years or so, it's going to be like a 50-50 split between real NFL fans and, and fantasy football fans. So do you see any like real innovations coming within the industry in the next however many years? I'm interested because, you know, uh, overseas, from what I understand, you know, they, mm -hmm. they allow gambling um, at the at the stadium. And that's all that's the only place you can go, um, you know, to, to get your gambling. How much of that actually 
you know, makes a dent in terms of, you know, attendance figures. I'm not sure. Look, the bottom line is the NFL, you get eight home games uh, and some preseason games as well that they charge you for. But the the bulk of their attendance money is going to come from those eight games. Even, I, I mean, the, the crazy thing is, I don't, not that they don't care about attendance figures, but I still think they're still heavily reliant on media money. You know what I mean? So, yeah. and I don't want to say TV revenue because I think they're working on things where, look, we saw a Twitter show, you know, you're going to start seeing stuff on Amazon, um, but basically rights fees, you know, wherever that's going to be, wherever that lives, I think that's still primarily uh, going to be their largest source of revenue because they just don't have enough games yeah. to sustain the baseball model where most of their money comes from attendance and gate figures. You know what I'm saying? So, um, so yeah, I mean, in terms of innovations, in terms of in, in stadium experience, I mean, so long as they can find, you know, 80,000 people in a major metropolitan area to come eight times, it's not that difficult. You know what I'm saying? So I, I don't think that they're, they actually need, well, I don't. I, they do need innovations, but I'm saying I don't. I don't necessarily know if that's going to be a driving force uh, behind um, behind you know gate figures. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, dude, like, why why not open up the stadiums on those eight weekends when you're not playing a home game? Let I don't know ten thousand yeah. fans in, sit on the grass, like hang out that's with a their great friends, idea. right? Like have a little picnic with your friends and put the red zone on the screens yeah. or something like that. I feel like that would sell out in five seconds. And those would all be fantasy <laughs> footballers, you idea. know what I mean? That's a pretty good idea. I like it. Right? I just thought of that like off the top of my head. But those are the innovations. Like those are the innovations these NFL owners and teams need to be thinking about on the go because that's the way the world is working now. With the more social media connected world and industry that we have, it's like these are the things that are really happening. And these owners, the ones who don't want to talk about analytics and the ones who don't want to talk about social media are the same ones who are getting fired left and right because they're not adapting to the new game. And this is like the NFL game. This is marketing. This is social media. This is fantasy football. It's all, it's all intertwined. You know what I'm saying? And NFL, you need to hire this man. That's what you need to do. This guy, this guy's got the ideas, baby. Come cool. on, let's go. Yeah, come on, man. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to also talk about the specific content that you were putting out at the NFL Network. Um, and also, I guess if you, so you recently left the NFL Network. You guys parted ways, and yeah. I, I'm sure you got you can't really get into the details of where right. you're going next or what really happened. Do you? Was it centered around? Um, I, I see a lot of the people from the NFL Network kind of leaving and dispersing and going other places right now, too. Would you connect that to the fact that they don't put enough resources into the fantasy football um, sphere? I, I mean, as much as you want to open no. up here, I don't know how, you know. No, I, I, that, I don't think that has anything to do with it, honestly. Okay. My departure there, look, it's not like they just eliminated my position and, and then are just saving that money. You know what okay. I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. they are going in a different direction and the money's still going to be the money, you know what I mean? So the budget's still the, the, the same. So it's not like they're they're saving uh, by not bringing me back or whatever it was, right? So look, man, it's a brutal business. The fact that I was there for four and a half years, I think that's great for me. Um, and it was the best time of my life, you know? But it's such a hard business television, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I've seen guys get, you know, wiped out in nine months, you know, forget about, you know, four and a half years. I've yeah, seen guys yeah. say, nah, this guy's not working. Let's get him out of here. You know what I mean? So it's such a hard business. Um, and and I'm really not, you know, mad or upset or, or bitter about the departure. This stuff just happens. Um, I am sad that I am not coming back into that building because of the great relationships that I built there. Um, would it have been nice if they could have had enough foresight to bring the entire cast back. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. hundred percent. That would have been awesome. Uh, we had such an amazing chemistry going. Um, but you know what, man, these places, they're a little bit like, you know, they're giant glaciers, you know, they move slowly, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, they're not nimble. They're not quick. So I think it probably would have taken them another year to even realize Hey man, these guys got an awesome chemistry going. You know, maybe yeah, we yeah. should do something here. You know, so um, I just think they didn't really realize it until everyone dispersed to the winds, and then you know, 
and again, so it's just like I said, it's just a it's a very tough business um, to stay in, uh, and, and sports television in particular, seeing so many cutbacks that look, it, it, I, I'm not. You know, I'm not, of course, I'm not happy about it, but it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, I don't think it was mostly about finances. I just think they just want to go in a different direction and, and what the hell. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I definitely don't think you're bitter about whatever yeah. happened there because I saw the letter that you wrote and penned to the other colleagues and the people that you worked with. And I thought that was awesome. Uh, a lot of respect to you for putting that out there. I'm sure the guys that you worked with, you know, love you for that. Um, so that was, that was very cool to see because it's very, you know, relatable and Thanks. personable. So, so props to you for that. Um, and I'm assuming you can't really, uh, give us a hint at, at where you're going next. Are you, gonna, <laughs> are you going to be going right back into a, another platform? Or are you going to, you know, you should start a YouTube channel, man. I, I think, I think it would work for you. <laughs> um, I am, uh, I will be in fantasy football. Um, it, it, it most likely will be in television in some capacity. Uh, we're working out some final details, man. I'm, I'm close. Uh, I'm at the one yard line, if you will. Okay. So, uh, but yeah, no, I, I can't, I can't say anything officially yet. Cause I haven't put pen to paper and you know, you never know. So, all right, cool. Well, I'm definitely uh, looking forward to seeing where you land and I'm sure you'll do a fantastic job wherever it is but listen man if you ever uh, if you ever do want to venture into the youtube game i could probably help you out and give you a few tips and whatnot um i like it i'm uh, I i'm i'm curious as to when you are working at these networks because you do have a boss that you obviously answer to the content that you create whether it's writing or whether it's on tv is that all laid out for you uh are you given are you empowered to kind of talk about whatever you want or is that something that kind of comes in as you, you know, gain your stripes and they're like, you know, we trust you more and more. So go, go write your piece, go do your thing. Like how, how does that actually work behind the scenes? Uh, all of that is true. So okay. there's stuff that they create for me. There's stuff that I create for myself and you're right. Um, you know, when I stepped in day one, I wasn't, you know, trying to lay out these crazy ideas, you know, but when you start to, again, as you say, earn your stripes, I think you feel a lot more comfortable saying like, you know, I actually do have this idea. It's going to sound a little crazy, but just, just trust me on this, you know, hear me out on it. Um, and then they kind of let you go from there. So, um, I look, if you watch the NFL network, if you watch the NFL fantasy live, if you've been following me for any, any period of time, um, you know, we did this crazy bit called the danger zone, right? So like that was an idea that was birthed from Adam rank um, for an online only segment. Um, and it was for the now, I think defunct NFL now, um, arm of NFL media, which I don't think exists now, but whatever. Um, mm -hmm. and I saw it on there and man, I really thought, you know what, this has got some real potential. So I kind of worked with Adam to kind of tweak it a little bit. We had a producer, um, that we worked with as well. We just try to get everything kind of molded and, and as TV friendly as possible. But even then it, it's still pretty out there, man. And, yeah. um, it's one of those things where you just got to tell the guys like, Hey, listen, you got to trust me. Um, it's going to work, but, you, but you know, it's not going to be for everybody. So that, that last bit, that's what scares people. Is when you say it's not going to be for everybody. It's yeah. like, well, what are we talking here? 50 50? We're talking 10 90? Because if it's 10 90, we probably don't want to put it on air. But yeah, no, I, people really, really liked it. It, it got the most, uh, some of the most, um, it, it was one of the most engaged posts uh, on social. And I think it really resonated with a very strong core group of, uh, of, fan, of, of people who are into fantasy football, but also kind of liked all the pro wrestling references that were kind of coming out of there. But, you know, you talk about the content, man. Um, I was, I was pretty much the only guy there that was doing television, podcasting and writing a weekly column as well. And a lot of it was just me for me, I just like the process of of creating content, you know, like coming up with ideas, putting pen to paper um, and, and just kind of being able to kind of, you know, having all these various levels of being able to, again, either talk about it on the podcast, write about it for, for the website and then doing stuff in, in a much more condensed uh, and simplified way for, for television as well. So I don't know, man, it was it was a lot of fun. It was really gratifying. Um, especially for my creative side to kind of be able to do all of those things. But for the website, 
um, my columns, those were all self-generated. Nobody came up with that. Okay. Um, for me, it was just me kind of looking at trends and, and, um, and looking at numbers and saying, oh, you know what, this kind of interests me. Let me write about this. Um, it had a cross-platform element to it because um, I knew that I was writing for the website, but I also knew um, that I was going to condense it all down and then throw it on TV as well. So they gave me a segment um, on television to kind of be able to talk about those next-gen stats. So, you know, for, so for that part of it, um, I, I was, a, you know, content creator there as well for the television side, man, look, it's just a giant team of people. You know what I'm saying? Um, all, all my co-hosts were able to create, uh, a certain amount of content for themselves, but we had producers too, you know? So we've got, you know, a couple of producers working on the shows. We had a segment producer that, uh, somebody who just literally just works on one segment uh, and then you've got, you know, uh, the, the main producer of the show that kind of works on the entire layout, the outline, the rundown, as we call it in the business, how the show is going to flow, all the topics that we're going to talk about um, and how we're going to how we're going to attack every single one of those topics as well. So in terms of the main you know, content creator for the television show that falls on the shoulders of the producer okay. and then it's up to the host to kind of work with the producer to varying levels. I was a pretty hands-on guy, so um, I really worked with my producer very closely to kind of talk about, hey, should we be talking about, you know, Julio Jones this way? What do you think about, you know, maybe bringing up Julio Jones in this segment and, and kind of just kind of get our minds together, minds wrapped around it, um, and thinking not about not only the, the, the stuff we're going to say, but how is it going to look on TV? That's kind of where that extra layer is uh, in terms of being a television host. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I think like what you were saying about, you know, you did a podcast, you have the video content, you're writing and things, and that's so crucial in today's day and age because when people oh, want to yeah. yeah, when people want to follow you and they want to know what you're up to, like you have to be everywhere. You have to be everywhere or you're going to fall behind, which is why, you know, wherever you end up going because you have all those key personality traits and the and those characteristics and what you're able to do is super valuable to like to any platform so i'm sure that will work out fine but that's interesting to hear how that works together and i guess it's like as you guys gain chemistry you know a as a team the, the show obviously becomes a lot better because you know when to say certain things how to say it how it's going to look on tv um so that's yeah that's really cool to uh to hear from you know behind the scenes of like the nfl network and things so thank you thank you for sharing that um and, you know, like, I, I don't know, I just, uh, an, another piece of this, like I was saying to you before, is just trying to inspire and motivate the, the younger demographics on how they can break through in the industry. And for the most part, like, you're not going to be able to, to get to somewhere that you, if, if you're inspiring to get to where James is, or if you're inspiring to get to where, like, an Evan Silva is, or one of the top guys, you're not going to be able to get there by doing the same things that they've done, right? You have to kind of pave your own path to get there. Um, so I like to kind of leave these episodes asking, you know, is there uh, actionable advice that you would give to someone kind of coming up into this industry or really any industry in, in general, just, you know, starting out and being all the way down at the floor level, whether it's, you know, a work ethic thing or whether it's being able to spot opportunities or like, you know, I guess the, the mic's kind of yours. So just, you know, what would you what would you say to these this younger group of people? So please ask me some follow-up questions because I have so much uh, in terms of what you were just saying there. Okay. Um, so much that I want to kind of think about. Um, and when I, you know, when you start start talking about, hey, make your own thing and and do your own branding, I think that's really difficult for people um, because coming up with new original ideas, especially in an industry that's been around for so long, is really really tough. I, well, this advice that I'll give it just. It, it, it's for varying degrees and varying levels of where you are in your career right now. Okay. Um, I would say step number one is honestly, if you want to write, you better be writing every day. And that's the thing that drives me crazy is, you know, if somebody says, well, I don't really want to write. I'm like, all right, well, great. Why don't you send me, you know, five samples? Well, I don't have any samples, bro. <laughs> what are you talking about wanting to write? You haven't written anything. Yeah, you, you got to put pen to paper. You got to start writing. 
And I would say if you're going to write, you better write every single day. Do you know how hard that is? That's so difficult. So hard. But I would – and what I tell people is, hey, listen, it doesn't need to be a freaking essay. Give me 500 words. You know, give me 500 words. Your time is made. You need – Hold up, please. Hold up, please. We're, uh, we're breaking up a little bit right now. Connections kind of hitting hitting a stag. Give me two seconds. Is the video choppy from your side? A little. Too bad. Really quick. Hold on. I'm gonna call you back in a second. Okay. What's up? Hey, there we go. All right, we kind of lost Better? you for a second, and I was like, it was, it was getting into the, the real inspiration mode, and I was like, eh, eh, eh. I was like, nah, they need a clear, they need this clear voice right now. <laughs> um, all right. Um, You're good to pick I'll, up I'll start that again. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Is that everything? Is everything good? Yeah, you're all good. This is all recording, so I'll edit out any of the stuff in between, so you can just pick up whenever you want. Okay. You look you look way clearer now too, for whatever reason. I don't know why. Really? So right. yeah, maybe it was a bad connection before. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, looks good. Cool. Um. So yeah, just kind of picking up on what you said, and again, I'd love for you to ask me follow up questions because um, there's so much of what you were kind of talking about that. Um, that you know that really gets my mind active in terms of how I got to where I got to. But first off, it's just like, look, man, there are some times when people are like, "Hey, I want to write," and I'm like, "All right, great, send me five samples," and they got no samples. I'm like, "Bro, what? <laughs> you want to write? You haven't written anything yet. I don't understand." So the bottom line is, you got to put pen to paper. And what I tell people is, look, you want to you want to write? Great, you got to write every single day, and it doesn't need to be you know some dissertation every single day, but 500 words, can you bang out 500 words? Cause that's what it means to be a professional writer. Somebody has got to say, Hey, listen, I need 500 words on X and you got to bang that out in the next, you know, six to eight hours period. That's gotta be, that's an automatic. Yeah, I can do that. Not a problem. Um, but you gotta be doing that every single day. And, and you gotta think about what goes into writing 500 words. That's gotta be, you're creating ideas every single day. So step one is I've got to come up with three story pitches every single day, and then I'm going to write about one of those things every single day. I know no one's going to do that. I, I know no one's going to do that because it's so time consuming. It's so much mental drain, and I get that. But I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, if you, I promise you, if you do that for, let's say, like a month, you will be shocked by how much better uh, of a writer and also a thinker that you will be in terms of being able to create story pitches because story pitches, that's the lifeblood of a writer, man. Once you create, have a good story pitch, man, you'd be surprised. The words just freaking flow. Um, and so yeah, 500 words a day, man. And then, and then again, we can start building up, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like training your body, but you're training your mind, you know, it's like, all right, we done 500 words. You crushed that. All right. Now once a week, we're going to mix in, you know, a thousand word you know, column and, and what, what, what kind of, what kind what, what does that look like? What are the ideas for that look like? So I would just say, if you want to write, you got to write every day. You want to be on camera? You better be on camera every single day. Exactly. Hey, listen, YouTube, whatever, Twitter, Twitter, I mean, snap, it doesn't matter, but you got to be on camera every single day. And again, what goes into that? You got to create a rundown. You got to talk about topics uh, that you want to be able to talk about. You know what I'm saying? And then take all of these things. You want to do a podcast, podcast, I mean, try to podcast every single day. If you're not podcasting every single day, you got to be talking into a mic every single day. And 
And if you want to have a weekly podcast, I think what you're saying is like an incredible point. And I think it speaks to the fact that you need to work hard to get to wherever you're going. And the point you make with like writing is good. And I want to convey this message to a lot of people is like, again, it's very subjective to if you're a good writer, then write every day. But again, like you said, if, if you're good on video, then make sure you're getting yourself on video every day and practicing and getting better. Because those are the only ways you're going to realize what you're bad at and you know what your strengths are and where you can pivot to and what you can kind of uh, improve on. And I think that also like just working hard, right? You're never going to be able to be uh, like you said, you'll never be the best, whatever fantasy analyst and neither will I, and I'll never be the strongest and tallest and fastest and, and best looking and all this stuff. Right. But there are a few variables that you can, um, that you can account for and that's working hard. And I think especially in a case like YouTube where fantasy football, the industry itself is, is not saturated whatsoever on YouTube. And I think that's why I've had success growing pretty quickly. And it's because people aren't willing to put the work in, you know, you do have to write basically an entire blog post for the video because you have to give out a lot of information, a lot of stats, and you have to go on and you have to actually record yourself doing it, be comfortable and look good doing it. Then you have to go edit it, upload it, you know, and, and do all this behind the scenes work that 99% of people aren't willing to do. But if you are in that 1% that's willing to work super hard at it, whether it's writing every day or whether it is the video, then that's a way to get ahead. Uh, personalities uh, already existing in this fantasy sphere. So, you know, there can only be so many Evan Silva's, there can only be so many Matt Harmon's in the world that are able to create their own brand um, and then kind of be able to, to do those things. Uh, you know, or I, I look at like Frisco Josh or Josh Hersmeyer or whatever, creating air yards. You know, right. there's, only, there's right. only so many things that you can do um, that are going to resonate with people. And I know that's got to be super, super intimidating. So what I was just saying, it goes back to, again, just working every single day and just, you know, grinding a little bit every single day and chipping away. It's like you got to put that work in. You know what I mean? Like you got to – bottom line is if you're watching tape, it doesn't doesn't matter if you're, you know, Evan Silva. It doesn't matter if you're me. It doesn't matter if you're you. As long, so long as you're exposing yourself to the game uh, and, and being able to, you know, realistically compare and contrast players. I think that's very, very important. I think part of it too is look, you gotta, you gotta really know the game, you know, really, you gotta really study the game, you know? And it's like, here's the thing you can't, and, and I struggle with this too. You can't beat everybody. Mm -hmm. And what do I mean by that? You know what I'm saying? Like you can't be Katie Nolan and mm -hmm. Evan Silva, right. And Stephen A. Smith. And Andy Holloway, and you know, and Matt Harmon. You can't beat all these guys. Yeah, you can only be, you know, yourself. And it's like the problem is like I and like I always feel this way too. And again, I struggle with it. It's like, I, it's like I feel like I'm chasing all the time. I feel like, oh man, you know what? I'm just gonna I'm gonna grind on like a hundred hours of tape, and I'm gonna be Evan Silva. And it's like, no, it doesn't work like that. You know why? Because at the same time, it's like. I got to be really proud of what I do, which is, listen, I'm a, a, a decent blend of, uh, of being an on-camera personality, also mixing that in with, with good, solid information. And like I said, what do I do well, right? It's, it's taking complex ideas and, and boiling it down to a simplified version. I don't make complex ideas and then make them even more complicated. Like you're not going to look at my, you're not going to look at my columns and see, you know, too many like color coded charts or anything. Cause that's not me, right. you know what I'm saying? For those people who that that speaks to, God bless you. But I don't know how to do that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So chasing those dragons, chasing those ghosts, man, um, that's definitely one of the more difficult parts. I think early on, and, and even when you get established, you're still constantly feeling like you're chasing people. But um, but yeah, there's got to be some blend of you know you got to look at stats and statistical history. You got to look at game tape. Um, and figure those things out. And, and, and again, just read. You got to be reading every single day, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like find, you know, five or six uh, writers that you love and just read their stuff every single day, too. That's the part of the process that people, I think, don't do enough of. The studying, the front end work. You got to study before you even come up with the idea. So this is like precursor to the precursor. You know what I'm saying? So it's like right. you got to study. And then come up with ideas and then write. So the the amount of work that goes into actually writing, it, it's, you know, that's like to me, I don't know, like 
thirty percent of it is, is the actual writing part. Oh, you know yeah. what I mean. Seventy percent of it is how much tape work did I do beforehand? How much research did I do beforehand? Um, and all I think all of that, and then and then the ideas, the idea creation. You know what I'm saying? Like all of that precedes the actual writing part. And when I actually get to the writing part, I find it to be actually pretty easy. And quite honestly, it's really uh, it's like a cathartic process, man, to be able to get all this information, condense it all down, and then spit it out. And you're like, ah. Great, finally, I got it out. It's great, it's wonderful, you know what I mean? So um, the writing, the actual writing part of it is is the easiest part uh, in my mind. I agree with you, man. I think it's like, you hear athletes talk about it all the time, man. It's the practice, it's the practice, it's the preparation and all the things that right. go into it. So once you're there, it's like, this stuff has been in your head and you've thought about it so much that when you actually have to you know, spew it out, it's, it's second nature to you. Um, and yeah. I, I think that like that's such a good point you say with all like the front end work because I have a lot of people reach out and be like, oh, how long does it take you to make videos? Is it like that much hard work? And I'm like, dude, I can guarantee you anyone that creates content, <laughs> right? Whether it's a blogger, whether it's someone who puts videos right. out, whether it's production in a real uh, studio, it's like whatever, however long you think it takes to do it, 5x that or 10x that. And that's probably yes. how long it takes to do because a 20 minute video that I might put out might take two and a half hours, three hours of research, the blog post, the video, the editing, all of that stuff. There is so much behind the scenes shit that goes into it that like people don't understand how hard it is to do that consistently. But if you can, if you're willing to put the work in to do that consistently, you are ahead of everyone else, man. It's just, it, that's just like the fact of the matter. You don't always have to be the best, but there are, like you said, like Matt Harmon, yeah, did a great job separating himself because he stuck to one specific niche and he does all yeah. fantasy analysts, but the wide receivers, the reception perception is just, it's golden. You know what I mean? And there are a few guys right. in, in the space um, that are able to kick, carve out things that work that way because, you know, I don't know if they got some brilliant mind stuff going on, but there are other ways to, you know, get noticed and it is putting the work in, it yeah. is putting the consistency in and realizing up front, you got to make a commitment and know, that you're about to put a crazy, crazy, crazy amount of work in with no guaranteed measure of success in the back end. That's probably the hardest part for a lot of people. But oh, yeah. at the same time, if you're passionate about it, then you're not really going to burn yourself out. You love doing it over and over and over again, and people will be able to see that in you. And I think that's what separates people that are successful from people that are not. Um, so just a couple of things. You know, it's like uh, there's got to be, you know, you talk about actionable takeaways, okay? Like I'll, I'll give you some real real easy ones is uh, how does Matt Harmon create reception perception? Well, it's not because he's, you know, recording every game. It's not because he's this magical wizard that is able to find uh, game tape. Look, you got to get game pass. If you want to write about football, you got to get game pass. I know it's expensive um, and it sucks, but it's one of those things where you have to invest in yourself mm -hmm. and that's the easiest way to invest in yourself. It, you got to find a way to scrounge up the money um, no matter where you come from to go get game pass, you got to go do that. I think another thing too, it's like, look, they have a lot of scouting schools online. I would find, you know, uh, a cheap, basic, you know, scouting school that you could go to. And it really opens your eyes in terms of how to watch the game. What are people, what are football, you know, analysts kind of looking at. And that also will separate you, um, from just your, common run-of-the-mill fan with just some random opinion of a player uh, to really being able to use your analytical mind uh, and, and and really break down, okay, well, what's this guy doing? It's like, okay, wow, I love I love this the way this guy sinks his hips uh, right before he, you know, runs an out route. You know, like his, his ability to sink those hips, that's really what gives him that explosion or whatever it is. His vision to find the hole, you know, it's – Okay, it's this is power versus zone. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. just basic things where it's like, hey, listen, you know, you can look at those numbers and statistical trends and all those things, and those are those are great. Those those will take you ninety percent of the way. But um, but if we're talking about just strictly fantasy or just football in general, man, you know, if you can't if you look at a play and aren't immediately like it, saying like, okay, that's a power trend. Not not necessarily calling out the plays, but saying, hey, that's power. Versus, okay, he's running outside zone here. Well, that's a problem. You know what I mean? So I would say find a way, and, and even if it's something like football for dummies, go to the library, go rent football for dummies, read that thing. You know what I mean? And there's so many scouting school classes that you can either pay for or get for free online. 
There's right. so much free online content. I so am, much. Matt, Matt Bowen is a guy that you should follow and, and, and read his work. Yeah, I mean, I am... I think like one of the, if not the most important trait of people that are successful is being able to be resourceful and just being able to find something that whatever you're trying to do, whatever goal you're trying to get to, like just finding a way to get it done. In today's day and age, like we have unlimited resources. I'm pretty sure you could learn to do anything you want in the world for absolutely <laughs> free, like literally You're anything. Right. You know what I mean? It, it might take you a little more time to find it, but be a little resourceful. Go on Google, go on YouTube. There's a literally the most incredible search engines like anything in the world like we've ever done. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, how do I do this? Like, dude, literally go on Google and type that exact phrase, what you just asked me, into there. So research it for five hours and boom, you have just taught yourself how to fish and you're good forever. And like, you know, what you're saying is like there are so many people willing to give out value because they realize that if you're giving out free value, like Samuel Gold is a YouTube channel. He's a great scouter and he, he, he'll break down specific players, uh, especially like rookies coming in that people are unaware of. And he does a great job of breaking them down and, and showing you like very in-depth things that are like more football, real football related rather than just like numbers and stats. Um, and, and he realizes that, you know, that's how he builds a loyal following and audience by putting the work in and giving you a uh, value for free, because that's in a day and age, like I'm saying, where everything is free and you can find everything for free. You trying to like sell, uh, sell things and sell yourself and always be that kind of spammy in that sense will never work. You're going to lose, uh, in, in a long-term game. And yeah, I mean, what you're saying is, is you invest in yourself, man, whether it is like you can, you could buy stuff. Exactly. That's a hundred percent a way to invest in yourself, but time is just as valuable as money is. So you can invest right. time into yourself as well. And that's kind of the point I was getting at with being resourceful is just finding a way to get it done. Um, I mean, they have cut ups now too. I mean, it's just incredible. You know, it's like, um, it used to take me forever to find cut, like to do cut ups of guys, you know, and it's just like, all right, now they have, now they have, you know, websites where it's, or YouTube channels where it's literally just like, college cut-ups of guys. And I'm like, yep. this is incredible. You know, it's like when I first started at NFL, they didn't really, I mean, they had it, but it wasn't that, you know, it, there wasn't that much of it. You know what I mean? Maybe some high profile guys, but now, I mean, there's random, like Michael Gallup cut-ups, like, <laughs> bro, really? This is <laughs> yeah. crazy. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, and I know that he was a high draft pick, whatever it was, but it's like, you couldn't find that stuff three years. You couldn't find a freaking Michael Gallup cut up three years ago, man. Um, so yeah, it's it, the, the amount of free online resources, you got to exploit that. And it's like, you talk about five hours. I mean, maybe I'm just slow, but it takes me <laughs> 20, 30 hours to figure out, you know, a new skill. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. um, so it's one of those things where, yeah, you got to invest the money, but you also get definitely more than that, more than the money you got to invest the time. Um, I'll say this, man, too. It's like part of it is, and this is really important for me, is you got to have a game plan. And you literally got to write your game plan down. I don't, I think too many people think about themselves and their career and whatever it is. They think about it like in this like super intellectual like cloud bubble and it's, you know, ethereal and it's just there. That's fine. Okay. But man, I am a person that, is super practical and I swear to God I get so pissed <laughs> when I start hearing people talk about this that and this other. bro pen and paper write that shit down please and, and it's like it doesn't need to be doesn't need to be 20 steps it needs to be five you know what I mean just write five write a five step game plan what's step number one what's step number two? when I finish step number one what's step number two when I do that what's step number three um, and, and it's, and those game plans can be as big or as small as you want them to be. You know, it's like, I have a five year game plan and I know exactly what I want to get done in terms of a five year game plan. I have a game plan for today. You know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> yeah. these are the things that I want to get done today. Yep. Right. So, uh, you know, I'm, I want to, I want to be able to do running back evaluations today. Right. So like, I got to, what I want to do is, for example, step one is, okay, um, I want to go through all 32 teams and identify what run scheme that they're going to run. Okay, that's step one. Now I'm going to match run scheme to running back talent. And then I've got to scout talent. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. um, it, it's just a step-by-step -step thing because if you don't do it that way and it's just this hodgepodge of, well, I'm just going to watch every running back. Bro, you'll be there all day. 
hundred percent. You know what I mean? You can't you can't do it that way. So it's like, all right, you got to break it down. And and I'm not even saying the what I'm doing is the best way, but you got to have a way. And and any way is going to be more efficient and more streamlined than just this random hodgepodge of just well, I'm just going to spend time to do it. I have a four year old and a wife. Like I don't have time to be spending forty hours. You know a week just randomly watching things like I just can't do that like yeah. I, I have to really streamline my time um and do those and, and hey, I'm, I'm making appearances on on random podcasts and and you do it's like I want to do those things you know what I'm saying and to be able to do those things that you want to do you got to be able to be very efficient with your work that you're doing as well so um that would be my thing come up with a game plan come up with a five-year game a three-year game plan where do you want to be in three years how do you go about doing that? If, you're, if your thing is, in three years, I want to be working at Yahoo Sports as a writer for them. All right, well, let's figure out how we're going to go about doing that. Well, step number one, I got to go get a job writing. Step number two, I got to make contacts. You see what I'm saying? Like yeah. doing these things and, and fulfilling those steps, that's how, you, that's how you move up and do it as fast as possible. Um, going back to, again, the financial part of it, which is you got to find a job. And and I'll, I'll leave people with the thing that I brought you in with, which is you got to find a job, man. Um, and and again, I mean, of course, treat content creation as your job. But I always want people to be thinking about, okay, well, how am I going to get paid on this content? You got to make contacts. You know what I mean? You got to go go on LinkedIn. It's as simple as that. Um, I mean, in this whole process for myself. And again, I'm somebody who's at the network level. You know, even for me, even for me, it's LinkedIn contacts. It's going through my phone and, and texting people and emailing people. Um, I've got 10 emails I had to send today. You know what I mean? So it's just a, it's a situation where you got to make contacts and you have to maintain those contacts. That in and of itself is 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 a little bit of a job too. You know, so. Um, you got to be able to move and move up and, and I'm not saying only know people for networking purposes, but unfortunately that is part of the game. And I say unfortunately, cause I'm not a natural networker. I don't really like doing those things per yeah. se, but you got to be able to maintain relationships, um, and kind of move up that way, man. It, it's crazy. I mean, every single job that I've gotten, um, and I have an agent. I'm not saying I'm not saying I don't. I do, but you know, even the interviews that I get, so many of them are either based on this guy's a friend of my agent or a friend of mine. You know what I mean? Or a friend of a friend. You know what I mean? Like that's how that's how this all works. That's how the game works, man. You gotta you gotta network. Yep. You know, and 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 with Twitter now, it's so easy. It's like, hey, at James D. Co., what do you think of this work? And if I like it, I'll retweet you. What the hell? I don't care. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, and just kind of building that network up. I mean, I, again, we go back to Matt Marmot. He, he built his whole damn career on Twitter. That's what's so crazy, man. Yeah. It's like, all right, here's perception, per perception. Boom, it's on Twitter. Boom, it's getting retweeted. You know what I'm saying? Like, he built his entire empire on freaking Twitter. Yeah. It's unbelievable what he's done. But he's doing that because he's also networking and also maintaining relationships with, with certain writers, certain guys that can eventually hire him to go do something. You know what I'm saying? Or recommend him to go do something. So uh, always think about, always be thinking about, hey, get this job. Um, you know, and and I eventually got to get paid to create that content, even if it's a side hustle. Even if it's a side hustle, you eventually want to start getting paid. Um, uh, moving forward. So that's even if it's 20 bucks, that's going to make you feel a hell of a lot better about whatever it is you're doing than getting paid nothing. You know what I mean? So that would just be my thing is it, it, it not only is it nice to get the paycheck, it also feeds into, you know, a, a stable mental, healthy mental state too. Right. You know what I mean? So yeah, and I think uh, that's a good point because, you know, when I'm putting the work in during February, March, April, and you know the revenue's not really showing, it, it can be like a big mental block in your head. Like, is this really worth doing? But you know, right. if, you, if you believe in what you're doing and, and you're putting out some good value, know in the back end, like now in the July, August, September months, things are really picking up and things are going well. But you, like everyone has to know that 
people feel the same way in those situations. So you do have to think of it from a perspective, uh, exactly how James is saying, and to the point of uh, networking. Yeah, man, like that couldn't be more true. Uh, and you got to realize that, uh, like the heart of it, everyone, everyone's a person. It might feel uncomfortable networking, but dude, there's like, I, it's not like I knew you before this. I didn't know Andy right. from the fantasy footballers. I didn't know James, um, uh, uh, James, yeah, ADHD, like any of that stuff. You know what I mean? So it's like they, you, you go into it with, uh, knowing that everyone is a human and they're willing to help people, even if they don't see value in it from themselves, because people are inherently good. I like to think that uh, I like to have that mindset, you know, and I think a lot of people need to have a mindset like that more so. And, and from you guys watching this, just literally, this is an example of it. They have no reason to come on to my show because it's not like I can give them an audience <laughs> that's bigger than their audience, you know, and, and reaching out, what's the worst that can happen? The person that I have, I've had plenty of people that didn't reply to this, but I have a few people that did and I'm, super super thankful and grateful for their time and the passion that they brought to it because it helps you guys out and uh it's definitely things that i've been able to take away and, and learn from this so uh i love what you talked about there which is and this is an old sales thing maybe it's my sales mentality i don't know what it is but i don't care about somebody telling me no you know you said hey what's the worst that could happen they could say no yeah and it's true but you but my whole thing and 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 i think i find this true uh of most people most people want to do work and just magically have their work recognized you got to ask for things you got i mean it's it's so funny when when uh, i have a four-year-old daughter uh, she has no qualms about asking for things <laughs> and somewhere along the way we yeah where'd she learn that from uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah you know what i'm saying like yeah. uh, it, that's what's so crazy is you know, you could learn from a four-year-old man. Like they ask for things, mm -hmm. and just depending on on who the parent is, there's going to be some amount that you're going to give them, no matter what. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So what the what's the takeaway there? The funny thing is that actually holds true even more so as an adult. You got to ask for things. It's got to be a situation where you don't care about somebody saying no. And now I'm not saying be aggressive or whatever. Be so respectful. Oh my God, be so respectful of the person's time and consideration. Be super respectful, but you gotta ask for it. If you wanna, if you wanna write for somebody, you gotta ask for it. Hey, can I write for you? Hey, can I do this? Hey, I'll do whatever. And, and when you're asking for something, have a very specific thing that you're asking for. Right, it's not like a hey, can I work for you? Yeah, it's got to be a hey, I have this thing. Can I can I sell this to you? You see what I'm saying? Can I put this on your website? And if you do, can I get 20 bucks for it? And if I get 20 bucks next time, can I get 40 bucks? You see what I'm saying? So you're just you're constantly asking for things. And if somebody says nah, I'm good, then it's like all right, that's fine. But hey, if it's cool, can I follow up with you in three months? Just, or can I follow up with you in a month? And they might say, nah, it's cool. You know, well, you know what? Follow up with them in a month anyways. Yeah. I don't care. I mean, it's like, you know, you're not, I mean, as long as you're being super respectful, you're never going to burn that bridge. Right. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? And you just never know when an opportunity will arise. I think that's, I think that's part of the thing. You got to put yourself in a, in a situation where if an opportunity is there, all of a sudden they're thinking, you know what? I remember that dude. I kind of like that guy's thing. Hey, let's reach out to him. Let's see what's happening. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you got to put yourself in a position to, to succeed. And to do that, you got to ask for things. And, and again, I, I, and you got to have a very specific thing that you're asking for. And also, man, please, 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 you got to be so respectful of their time and consideration. I think those are the two things um, that I would say uh, has helped me move forward in my own career. When I first transitioned from news to sports, that's because I asked my boss straight up, hey, listen, I've got this thing. Um, and I used, uh, I used to work for Fox in L.A. And, and I'm like, hey, listen, you're Fox. You, you cover the UFC. You've got no UFC content. I can give you UFC content, but you got to make me – you got to you, you know, you gotta put me as a sports reporter. I got to be able to cover Lakers, Dodgers, Clippers, you know, UCLA, USC. I got to be able to cover those things. But also, I will give you a buttload of UFC content, and I promise you that's going to kill. Yeah. And, and and my boss looks at me and is like, well, okay, I'll think about it. <laughs> but you know what, though? 
that's eventually what got me that sports. You know what I'm saying? And if I didn't ask for that, that I wouldn't have a sports tape. If I didn't have a sports tape, I wouldn't be able to to apply that sports tape to NFL Network. If I, you know what I'm saying? So I would have never got to NFL Network if, if going all the way back, I wasn't able to ask for that one thing yeah. way back then. Yeah, I think the point about being specific is – like literally can't be overstated because I have a lot of people that reach out to me and are like, Hey, I like what you're doing with the channel and the brand. Like uh, I'd love to help out. So let me know. And I'm, I'm like, I would love for you to help out too. But now it, it goes into more of like, it, it takes a lot more time for me to start thinking about like, where can I plug you in? How do I figure out what I want you to do? Like, are you a good fit for it? So you're so right. When, when you want something, you need to be super specific. You need to realize that the person you're asking doesn't want to have to sit there and be like, oh, no. now now it's another burden for me to think about. It's like you have to give them no reason to say no to you. I think that's like an incredible point you put out for asking for things specifically. It's, it's really, really big takeaway for you guys listening to this for sure. Um, I, I, think, I think that probably wraps up most of the questions I had for you. Uh, and I guess, you know, if you have any departing remarks, um, you, you can feel free to kind of throw them at my audience. Otherwise, please tell them the best spot to find you. I'm sure they would be – have no problem following you on Twitter. And when you do make your YouTube channel, they'll subscribe to your channel. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean they can follow me on Twitter. Look, I mean the, like, like I said, I have a lot of you know takeaways and you know actionable things that, that I, I want young people to do and because I want people to be successful too, man. You know, yeah. and it's like – when you're successful, you're happy, and I just want everybody to be happy out there. You know what I mean? So, like, that's that's the thing. But yeah, man, you know, get get your paper, baby. Get money. It's all good. No, but I mean, look. Uh, but the bottom line is, man. You know, I just think, you know, again, the the two things is you got to do something every day, um, and you got to come up with game plans. I guess it's three things, and then you got to ask for things. You know, those are the three things that I that the you know three pillars in terms of what has been successful for me what has worked for me. Um, and, and, and again, I'm not the guy that's the most talented dude. Look, obviously I'm not the most handsome dude out there. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't have some kind of crazy sports background. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm not a former athlete. I mean, it, it's people always say like, Oh, I could do what you do. And I'm like, yeah, you probably could, <laughs> but you, you're not because I have something internally. I have a drive inside that I don't think you have. And I think that's probably the major difference is I'm just a guy that grinds it out, man. Like, I'm gonna outwork your ass. I mean, that's, the bottom line is I'm gonna outwork your ass. And not only that, I'm gonna outthink you, man. Like that, so so again, it's like, you know, people always say like, hey, I could do what you do. And I'm always like, yeah, you probably could, bro. I mean, you, <laughs> honestly, you probably could. Yeah, but... I mean, anyone watching this, they, yes, you probably could do what I do. There's no doubt about it because right. I'm not some kind of special talent. I'm really not. Um, but are you willing I guarantee to put the work you, I've in? thought about it longer, harder, and more intelligently than than damn near most everybody out there. So, um, so yeah, I, I would just say approach your own careers that way. You know what I mean? Be very self-reflective and be intelligent and very self-aware about where you are and where you want to get to and how do you want to get uh, to to where you want to get to. So, you know, it, it took a while, but it seemed very quick to me because when you're in the grind and, and you're staying hyper-focused, time flies, man. Correct. The time flies. So, yeah, man, um, if people want to follow me, feel free to do so. I'm, I'm really responsive, or at least I try to be on Twitter um, as much as I can. Um, at James D. Co. Uh, is where you can find me on Twitter. Please follow me on Facebook as well. Uh, not as responsive, but, you know, I do try to uh, be pretty responsive on Facebook as well. It's facebook.com slash James D. Co. there as well. If you want to see pictures of my daughter for whatever reason, I don't know why. You can follow me on Instagram. Um, my Instagram's all that kind of stuff. It's very few fantasy takeaways. There's some every now and again, but it's just more life updates, man. Um, you'll see pictures of beer and me drinking and stuff. So, uh, you can follow me on Instagram too. It's uh, James D. Co on Instagram there. So I've got it all wrapped up, man. But yeah, that's, uh, that's it. If you want to follow me, feel free. Um, I do try to be pretty responsive, but it's been a blast. I appreciate you having me on here.
Awesome, man. Well, James dropped the big facts for us on the channel. I will link all of his social stuff below, the Facebook, the Twitter, the Instagram. You can check out his, I'm sure, very, very cute daughter and the rest of the beer selection he's got going on over there. Uh, but James, thank you so much again for joining us on the channel. I know my audience will love this. Guys, hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. And we'll see y'all uh, tomorrow morning for the live stream. So peace.